Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we're glad that um, uh, that uh, Reverend uh, Dave is here. He's our our speaker for tonight, and uh, Pastor Jenny's here, and Andy's here from Fall River. Did, Andy, do you have people in your uh, in your room with you? Hello. Hello. I guess you do. Yes, we're, uh, we're we're well appointed here. There's a there's a there's a goodly gathering of us. Very good. I'm glad to hear that. So, uh, okay. So, um, welcome again. And we're going to start off with a little bit of worship. Um, you should probably put your uh, selection on speaker view uh, because uh, the you're going to want to be able to see the worship as it appears on the screen. Uh, and probably keep it on speaker view for most of the evening um, so that you can uh, focus on either the PowerPoint or on Reverend Dave as he speaks. All right. If you're on a uh, mobile phone or a, an iPad, you're going to want to you're uh, you're going to want to uh, scroll so that you see the program in the main part of your viewfinder. OK, so that's how we're going to start. We'll just begin with. Uh, a little bit of worship here. And, uh, here we are. We're going to, we're going to read, uh, this Psalm responsively by the whole verse. Well, I'm trying. There's a way to do it. I got it. Uh, let's read Psalm 111 responsibly by the whole verse. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the Great works, are the of, works the Lord, of the Lord, studied, studied by, by all who delight in him. Full of honor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has, he has gained, gained renown by, by his by wonderful, wonderful deeds. deeds. The Lord is, the Lord is gracious and, and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenants. He, he has, has shown, shown his people the power, the power of his, of his works, of his works in, giving in giving them the heritage of, of the nations. nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Amen. Uh, we're going to we're going to hear a piece of music. You can mute yourself and and uh, sing along. It doesn't sound too good when we're all uh, singing live into the channel. So here we go. Perfect. 
and Eastern unending joys we may attain at last. Amen. Please join me in this prayer. Let us pray for all the peoples in the church and the world who need mercy, justice, and peace for the church of God and for all who witness the glory of God. And you all say, Lord, have mercy. For this world and for the sharing of health and healing, Lord, have mercy. For those stigmatized as unclean and for those who touch and heal them, Lord, have mercy. For all who practice the medical arts and for physicians of the spirit, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For all who are sick and in need of prayer and for the dying and those who grieve, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. God who sends us to wash in the river of healing, hear the prayers we offer you this day and enable us to proclaim your good news and spread the word of your salvation through, through Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ our, our Lord. Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Tonight's speaker, the Reverend Dr. David Bueller, OSM, is a Lutheran minister, author, filmmaker, software developer, educator, philosopher, and historian who has the internet memorized and has been recognized <laughs> by Marquise's Who's Who in Top Educators for his dedication and achievements and leadership in philosophy and ethics. He holds a BA in history and political science and philosophy from Wittenberg University. Uh, he has a master's of arts in teaching and social sciences from Reed College, a master of divinity in New Testament and ethics and church history from Harvard Divinity School. He has a doctor of philosophy from the Graduate Theological Foundation. Dr. Bueller has taught at Providence College, Jefferson High School, Katona Elementary School, he served Lutheran churches in West Haven, Connecticut, Providence, Attleboro, and Middleboro, Massachusetts. Dr. Bueller was director of pastoral care and coordinator of bioethics at Charlton Memorial Hospital and currently serves as president of the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, Lord Library Board of Associates. And that, my friends, only scratches the surface. Wow. So, welcome. <laughs> Welcome, Pastor Dave. Well, Don, you've really made me tired now. Just think about <laughs> <laughs> But I, uh, I appreciate the fact that in our uh, worship, we referred both to suffering and also to the uh, situation of the leper in society. Uh, when I became a chaplain at Charlton in 1980, and at that time, it was just about the time that there began to be recognition that there was an AIDS virus on the planet. And uh, it rapidly grew to be a worldwide phenomenon. And as you probably know, we're still fighting AIDS uh, around the clock all over the world, along with COVID. Uh, so. It, health is all around us as well as disease. A, cu a couple of things I want to stress tonight. One is that if, if we were having this Zoom in Israel, and I tried to get some of my friends, former rabbis at Fall River and so on, from Israel to join in the Zoom, but I, I guess they weren't able to hook up or whatever. But if we were having a worship service in Jerusalem, let's say, or Bethlehem, where our church has a synod actually in, in the Holy Land, and as well as in Jordan. And a person came up to us and greeted us, and they would say, Shalom. And the thing that's important to keep in mind about that is that when they say that in Hebrew, the word Shalom, and it also has a parallel in Arabic, the Arabic word is salam, but essentially the same word and the same meaning. But when they say that, they're really saying, may you be healthy, may you be whole. It's a, a kind of a blessing that people share 
on a daily basis as a greeting. Um, and they are actually saying, may you be filled with complete peace, because the word also means peace, uh, as it means in, in the story of the res resurrection, when the people are in the upper room and Jesus appears to them, he says, peace be unto you. Shalom, shalom aleichem is, is literally the, the Hebrew. Um, he, he's saying, may you have wholeness or wellness. May you be healthy. Um, now, now, having said that, I, I want to sort of look at the flip side of that. And that is the fact that disease and suffering have always been a part of life, just as death is a part of our lives. Um, I've experienced losses just in this past weekend of three people that I've known for a long time. One was my son's mother-in-law, so became a dear friend to, of, of our family, and we became a member of her family in a sense when her husband died. Uh, another was a very dear friend of mine who is a Catholic priest in the Diocese of Fall River. He died in December, and I didn't become aware of it until Monday. Uh, this is one of the frustrating things about COVID, I think, is that a lot of our communication uh, networks and so on are strained to the breaking point. I, my computer, I know, is, is overflowing with all sorts of things, but uh, and the third one was I became aware today that a pastor in our church died of the same disease which took my father's life, which was colon cancer, uh, and which I, because of that, I'm extra, extra concerned about it and, and always on, on the watch for that kind of thing. Uh, but disease can be perceived by us human beings, just given our own fallibility, and our own vulnerability as a kind of a punishment. And I think it's important that we stay away from that. Uh, when we sent out the schedule for this Lenten series, the passage I was to be talking about tonight was 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 to 19. But actually, uh, I also want to tack on to that a little bit more, which is verses 20 through 27, which talks a little bit about how a servant of the main character in the text, uh, who is Naaman, a Syrian commander, how he behaves in relationship to uh, healing and how he endures some suffering of his own. Um, the name Naaman, the name Naaman is actually um, a Syrian word that means, I shouldn't say Syrian, I, I really should say Aramean because it's really the Aramean people who form the background of Syria and the Fertile Crescent itself. Uh, if you go back and study the history of Assyria, you see that there were a great many people who spoke Aramaic, and those people we call Arameans. And so they're an absolutely huge part of the Middle Eastern population in the ancient Near East. Um, in this story, and, and could we have the first, I think it's the first slide that has the illustration on it? Or actually the one with the dramatis personae, the one before that, uh, if you can back up. Yeah, that one right there. The picture on the left there is a picture of our typical clergy meeting that we have, uh, used to have it at Percy's on Route 6 with pancakes. And that's a picture of us making pancakes over there. Uh, but actually, um, Lately, we've been doing more writing and publishing and so forth, especially Don, he does 90% of it. And uh, I, I want to go make sure you're aware of all the key characters in this story tonight. Naaman is a commander. He's a very high-ranking officer. He'd be analogous in our society to someone like Colin Powell, 
Uh, he was a very high ranking soldier. Um, his wife, however, took as a servant of hers, a young Israeli girl who was brought back from a campaign between Syria and Israel. And she is never named in the text, but she was a servant of Naaman's wife. Um, and then we are introduced to Elisha, the very important prophet in, in the second book of Kings. As you probably know, the book of Kings was originally one book. And then at some point in the development of the Hebrew Bible, it was split into two and the, the sort of a uh, hinge between the two is King Az Ahaziah. And uh, we, we're coming into the second Kings an early stage. Uh, and it turns out that the conflict between Israel and Syria ha is not at all over with. Um, in fact, the, the, the period covered in second Kings ends around 600 BC uh, or about 200 years after the stage we're at now. We're at roughly at, at about 800 BC now in this story. Um, and there are two important kings. One is the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad II. And just like the name that you run into in Fall River I, when I was living or working there, I knew a lot of people by the name of Hadad. Uh, often they were of Lebanese background. Uh, and the Israelite king at this time was King Yehoram, uh, or in, in some places he's called Jehoram. Um, and this was located in the region of Neo Assyria, means more later Assyria, not, not the pe early period of the Arameans, but now as the Syrian people were forming into one country, um, as well as Israel, which of course it had had the 12 tribes, but the tribes were beginning to be more consolidated. And we had a Northern kingdom, which had Syria, uh, excuse me, Samaria in it, and at the end of the book of Second Kings, uh, Samaria is attacked by the Syrians and uh, essentially sacked. Um, so there, there is a real sense of conflict here between Syria and Israel. Uh, it would be a little bit like today, uh, the relationship between, say, Israel and, uh, say, Iran. Uh, now, could we go to the next slide? This is a picture of uh, what ends up happening to Naaman. Uh, I found it's difficult to find a really adequate way to depict what it's like to have leprosy. Leprosy is, uh, I've, I've only been exposed to a person with leprosy once when I was a chaplain at Mass General Hospital back in the 1970s, it was the beginning of my clinical internship. Uh, and that was a case where we were not even allowed to visit the patient because there was so much fear of contagion, even then, and that was in the 19, uh, late 1970s. Um, The way the text, and I've, I've taken out the versification of the text here, and it basically shows us that Naaman was a, a, a very important, honorable, great leader in the eyes of his master, Ben-Hadad, because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. In other words, he was a victorious, let's call him a general, because that's essentially what he was. But at the same time, he was also a, not only a man of valor, but he was also a leper. Uh, and he had acquired this disease, perhaps from the exposure in military situations. That happens even in modern times. We have uh, people coming back from war who bring back 
the results of exposure that they've had to different chemicals and so forth. And the young nameless servant girl who waits on Naaman's wife says to her, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. So in other words, there is this prophet in Samaria who it turns out to be Elisha. Because she says, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, thus and thus, said the girl who is from the land of Israel. And then the two kings begin to kind of negotiate this situation. Uh, let's stop there. And uh, we got a discussion question. We'll break into our groups. Don, can you explain how that works? Yeah, I'm going to, uh, uh, we're going to take a look at this question. Uh, and then I'm going to divide the group into uh, uh, five different random, randomly chosen discussion groups. Uh, Andy, I'm not sure how you're going to participate. Probably have your own discussion uh, there in Fall River. And then, um, you know, when we come back, you can report or somebody from your group can report for Fall River. Uh, so here's the question. Why do you think the servant girl made a kind of referral of Naaman to the Israelite prophet Elisha? Does this seem at all odd to you? If so why? So we're going to take just four minutes uh, in your group just to say hi to each other and then sort of uh, get your mind around what's going on in this story. Sound good? Let's continue with the next slide. After the, the servant girl, the nameless servant girl had arranged to have this message go out, the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. So this is kind of like typically I travel when I take a trip, you know, I, I always take 10 changes of clothing. <laughs> then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. It doesn't say you must or that you will, but that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. And so this is the first time in this passage or this text that someone gets angry uh, and this emotion tells us something important and and the very next person we hear about is Elisha the man of God who heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king saying why have you torn your clothes Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Take a second to think about what was Ben Hadad of Syria trying to coerce out of King Jehoram of Israel? And why did Jehoram tear off his royal clothes? Does anybody have a, an immediate thought about why he might have done that? Is that a way of uh, showing a fit of anger? That was part of his anger. It was certainly uh, expressive. Um, it also seemed as if he felt that he was being coerced. And he, even though he, he probably really wasn't being coerced, because it said, you may heal this man, but he didn't say you must me heal him. It shows the underlying conflict between these two countries and these two, two kings who are obviously rivals uh, for territory and power at this time in their history. Um, now, let's look at the map on the next, next slide and uh, you'll get a little bit better picture, I think, of the uh, relationship between uh, the Syrians and the uh, Israelites. Um, 
this map is really not meant to depict Israel. It's meant to depict Syria, ancient Syria. But what you can see is that it over completely overlaps with the area that now is uh, Israel. Um, you, you have Damascus pretty much in the center of that map. And above it, if you go way, way up, you'll see Aleppo, which is in a modern city still in Syria, and one that was almost totally destroyed in the, the Syrian civil war. Um, Damascus is recognized as potentially one of the major cities of the ancient world uh, on a level with Baghdad uh, in Babylon or even Jerusalem. Um, you even see down below here, you see Megiddo. That, that's where we get the word Armageddon uh, and also you can recognize some other names that come up in both ancient times and modern times. There's Tyre and Sidon, uh, Beirut, which is a place where I almost went to college in, in my junior year in college. I was going to go spend one year in Be universe, American University in Beirut, but I pack, backed out at the last minute when I couldn't figure out how to pay for it. <laughs> Then there's one that's tricky, isn't that? There's Tripoli on there, and that's not the Tripoli in the Marines Corps hymn. Uh, that's a different Tripoli uh, that's part of Africa, but it means basically three cities or three small towns that are merged into one city. And Acre was actually the site of a famous uh, battle in the uh, 10th century Crusades. Uh, and finally, Samaria at the bottom there, you can see pretty, if you look closely, you can see the Sea of Galilee, which looks like a little tiny, uh, tiny body of water. And then the Jordan River going down from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. And as you can probably imagine, the, the Jordan River at this time was uh, it, it may be it, it's kind of like in India you have the Ganges River which is a holy river but it's absolutely dirty and muddy and and you know, not really very appealing. Um, Samaria on the other hand uh, I mean uh, Damascus on the other hand had a number of famous rivers and still does uh, <laughs> which had crystal clear water. And so when it turns out that Naaman is told by Elisha that he needs to go down to the Jordan and wash himself, um, he, he, he reacts the way you and I probably would react. He, said, he says in verse 12, are not the Avana and the Farpar, and there's another one called the Baidal, these rivers in Damascus, aren't they better than the ones in Israel? And, you know, that's kind of like local pride. Um, could I not wash in them and be clean? It's like Mystic River in Boston, you know. It's not the prettiest river in the world, but it's, it's a very important uh, river in, in Boston history. And so he turned away, and he, he was in a rage. This is the... Uh, uh, that second sort of emotional outburst in this passage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, if the prophet had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean. So we're, we're getting a, a, a different kind of feeling here about this sense of being clean. This is sort of a shift from the idea that, that the leper is this shunned, outcast who is made to feel dirty and unclean and, and made to walk through society saying unclean, 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 and maybe even ring a bell to let it be known. So he went down and he actually obeyed. You know, he's a military man. He knew that sometimes you have to obey orders. I remember a famous article written about medical authority and in that article, it was stated that the only time Hit Adolf Hitler ever obeyed anybody was his doctor. 
in his entire life. Uh, and in this case, this Syrian commander, a high ranking general went down and dipped seven times in the very muddy, dirty Jordan River, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. I just want to say a little bit more about leprosy. Um, I, don't, I don't want to dwell on it particularly, um, but I think it's important to really fully appreciate this text to know that uh, what we call leprosy today is technically a, a condition called Hansen's disease, which is a caused by a mycobacterium called mycobacterium lepri. And that's where the word leprosy arises from. And it affects the nerves, the skin, the eyes, the lining of the nose. Uh, with early diagnosis and treatment, the disease can be cured today. People with Hansen's disease can continue to work and lead an active life during and after treatment. But in ancient times, leprosy was feared as a highly contagious, devastating disease. Now we know it does not spread as easily and treatment can be effective. However, if left untreated, the nerve damage uh, can result in crippling or loss of hands and feet, paralysis, and bl even blindness. Leprosy in the Bible, however, this is the important point, is not necessarily the same as Hansen's disease, even if the two seem to be similar at times. And the analogy I like to draw is that leprosy is a terribly disfiguring illness or disease. It can really ruin a human body, much like the rare disease experienced by Joseph Merrick in the 1800s, the so-called elephant man. Uh, today, another case has recently appeared in Rome and that was a patient by the name of Vincio Riva, who became a kind of uh, wandering leper in Rome, who would mostly come to St. Peter's Square. And there he could be, be basically function like a beggar, um, looking for some kind of help, whatever he could find. Um, he, however, he, we, we're pretty sure he doesn't have leprosy or Hansen's disease or uh, or what Merrick had, which is, I believe, called Proteus. But he might have had something similar. It involves particular kinds of pustules. And if you could have the next slide, it gives you an idea. It occurred about eight years ago where Pope Francis uh, met with Vincio in St. Peter's Square he uh, blessed him, he touched him, he laid hands on him. He, stories say that he even kissed him, uh, which, you know, is part of this sort of breakthrough that's occurring in this text. Um, just as powerful in a modern setting today, I think, as it is in the, in the second book of Kings. This is chapter five, verses 15 through 27, but let's at least go to 19. Um, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. That is said by Elisha. Because Naaman is so thankful and he makes this essentially a, a, an ex expression, an affirmation of faith, uh, such as you might find in, in people who encounter close contact with Jesus and who might have been, been rejected or in some ways pushed away but from him. And Naaman says, indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But Elisha says, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. 
and he urged him to take it, but he refused. And we've probably all been in situations like that where we want to thank somebody, and we want to give them something, but they don't want to receive it. So Naaman said, and if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth. For your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand and I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, when I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. In other words, he's apologizing to God uh, essentially meaning the one God, uh, just saying, you know, if, if I have to sort of maintain my relationship with my boss, the king in Syria, uh, please forgive me. Uh, and then he said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. Now, the interesting thing about this text to me that, that is so startling is how dishonest Elisha's servant is. Elisha, you know, every, it was not unusual for people to have servants in these times. <laughs> you know, it's maybe maybe like antebellum America, I guess. I, I don't know. But Gehazi, who is a servant of Elisha, said, look, my master has spared Naaman. He's, he's kind of like the unjust steward in, in the New Testament. He spared Naaman the Syrian while not receiving anything from his hands. And, and so immediately Gehazi starts doing a little finagling here. He says, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well? And that's essentially the same word as wellness or wholeness, is all healthy. Um, and, and of course, Naaman was, for all intents and purposes, it cured at this point. And he said, all is well. My master has sent me, saying, indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garment. And as we know, these people had all kinds of garments, so many that they might even tear them to shreds. So Naaman said, please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed the, them to two of his servants. And they carried them on ahead of him. When he came to the citadel, or it could just mean when he came to a hill, he took them from their hand. And he stored them away. He hid them, in other words. This is one of the ways we know that Gehazi was up to nothing good here. Then he let the men go, and they departed. And then he went in and stood before his master, Elisha. And Elisha was one of the great servants, as prophets of the Hebrew Bible. And Elisha says, where did you go, Gehazi? And he said to him, your servant did not go anywhere. So he's completely he's still either behaving like a, a, a young child who's trying to get away with something. And then he said to him, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and ox and male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants. So it's kind of like a vague awareness of public health concepts here that, yes, Naaman's been healed, but maybe Gehazi somehow has been ensnared by the uh, disease. And he went out from his presence and... Gehazi was leprous and says the ending of the passage as he was as white as snow because leprosy is not in biblical times at least 
leprosy is understood as something that sort of takes the blood out of the skin and, and is just a very um, enervating kind of illness. Um, I wonder, is it just kind of a theological question? Is this over much punishment uh, for Gehazi? Or, you know, he's, he's, he's obviously committed a felony, but uh, <laughs> do we think that this is poetic justice in any way? Or do we think that there's something right or wrong about this punishment that he suffers where he ends up with a disease that Elisha was trying to cure. Um, and he is a servant of Elisha, but it, obviously he's a dishonest servant. And to me, that there's a, an, a wonderful contrast there between this nameless servant girl who makes this whole story happen and makes it possible for Elisha to heal Naaman. But Naaman's own servant is faithless and uh, dishonest. Um, I, I, I personally think it's a, a severe punishment, uh, mm -hmm. but in some ways it is like many old ancient tales of justice or injustice, a kind of poetic justice. And I like to close, I, I think we're nearing the end of our time here, but I like to close with uh, just a short passage from a Psalm from King David. Uh, I think we all are familiar with this passage. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in in within me bless his holy name bless the lord O my soul and do not forget all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity who heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy who satisfy, satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is rene renewed like the eagles um, this is actually a psalm of thanksgiving for healing, uh, psalm number 103. And I hope as you come back to uh, the remainder of these weekly uh, to be sessions on healing, we'll be looking at different kinds of healing, um, not just physical healing, but also healing of mind and spirit, healing of the whole person, the whole shalom, you know, and I hope that that will be kind of the overarching theme that we'll experience through this uh, wonderful, what, how many years have we been having these series now? Yeah, we're, we're in, we're in year 14 now. 14, huh. Yeah. So we're, we're now an adolescent uh, program. We're, we're <laughs> sort of reaching our years now here. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Reverend Dave. So we have hope a if, if, you, if you don't normally read the book of Second Kings, I hope that this will, uh, you know, in, encourage you to see that it's actually not as uh, remote as some parts of the Hebrew Bible. It's not, it's hard to get a hold of. Uh, it's good to have a really good study Bible or whatever, but often you just pick it up and you start reading and you find out there were all these kings, just countless kings in the ancient world. Uh, and Israel was this country that set the stage for the coming of son of David. Well, thank you, Pastor. Uh, and I, I just uh, give you a, a, just a, an applause for your thank wonderful you, presentation. You. And uh, uh, thanks everybody for joining. We got room for uh, many more people. 
Uh, so if you want to spread the word, you, you probably received at least one, maybe more email that has uh, the link. The link for next week is the same. It's not going to change. Oh, so good. save save the email. Uh, the, the link goes live at 645 and then we start at 7. Um, you know, invite more people to join. Next week we'll hear from Andy uh, uh, in uh, Fall River. And uh, it's going to be a, a, another good uh, presentation as we make our way through all of the different types of healing uh, that are offered, health and healing in the Bible. Um, we felt that as we gathered uh, to press pancakes, uh, we felt that um, it was a good idea to maybe approach this notion of healing. Uh, maybe not lay it all out before you in terms of, of, of uh, you know, COVID and, and, and all of that, but to connect with the different scriptural truths of healing and then uh, and really plant the seed so that you do your own study, your own uh, uh, ruminating, you're thinking about what we talked about tonight, thinking about Naaman and, 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 uh, and, 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 you know, the, the degree of righteousness that went on and, and next week it'll, we'll, you know, we'll be on to, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, the gospel of Mark. So, so, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week and, uh, we can close with a little prayer and then we'll say good night. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word that inspires us and, and, uh, and builds us up, that, that uh, prepares us to deal with every question of life that both in the Hebrew Testament and in the New Testament, we are aware of covenant and the ramifications of covenant that uh, we all move along together hoping to deepen our understanding of your word and our understanding of our world and being more equipped to suffer and to grow and to uh, uh, meet the challenges of this world through the grace of your word that comes to us in these Bible studies. Bless the teachers, Lord, bless all those who attend, bless us all in our own need for prayer and pour your grace upon us until we meet again next Wednesday. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.